Thank you, Taylor, and thank you, everybody and audience for your attention today. My name is Darren McAvoy. I'm an Extension Associate Professor of Forestry and Wildland Fire here at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. And here we go. Um, I also represent the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network based out of Fort Collins, Colorado, and I chair the Utah Biomass Resources Group. I also chair the Utah Prescribed Fire Council in uh, full disclosure. Um, and my partners, I don't do anything without partners, including the Utah Department of Natural Resources, the Utah Bureau of Land Management, and the USDA Forest Service. And I'll start off with a question. Uh, do you prefer wildfire or prescribed fire? Either way, we have to breathe some smoke. We have a fire deficit in our country from years of fire suppression, and we have to figure out ways to, to make up for that problem. Let's start with a short history of fire um, in Utah and, and the U.S. I want to start with uh, the diaries of Albert Potter. I host these on my website, forestry.usu.edu, and I find them a fascinating read. In 1902, the first head of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, uh, authorized or contracted with this uh, Arizona sheep man, Albert Potter, to ride, spend the whole summer riding by horseback through the ranges and mountains of Utah to assess the quality of the forest, how much had been burned and how much had been logged and how much timber was left and uh, how much grazing was going on. And as well, he spoke to uh, folks in each of the towns to assess if they wanted national forest. At the time, they were calling them forest preserves. And it, it's you can read day by day his, his journal and how far he rode each day on this particular day when he was down in uh, the the dividing line between Paiute and Sevier counties on November 5th, 1902, he rode 30 miles and he talks about uh, um, the mill, the sawmill that was there and uh, got moved up the stream and cut out another area. Um, and then he goes on to talk to some of the locals and get their feel. In general, most people wanted the forest preserves because there was uh, a lot, too much grazing. It was, the land was being overgrazed and there were a lot of sheep, dead sheep in the creek and it was following the, the water qualities. And so they wanted better control of the grazing. There were a lot of herds coming from out of town and out of state and uh, the locals wanted a little better control of that. So yeah, this is Albert Potter. One of the interesting things that Potter pointed out um, along his way when the day he was at Alta, now known as Alta Ski Area, uh, where this photo is from. He quote, he, his quote from that day is, you couldn't find a stick big enough to kill a snake because they had logged it so heavily. I think uh, their forest has recovered sufficiently that I think you could find a big a stick, uh, a stick big enough to kill a snake in this forest now. And we're all familiar and uh, most of us are familiar and, and enjoy Lake Powell on a warm day. And uh, John Wesley Powell, namesake, uh, he was the second director of the U.S. Geological Survey in Washington after he did all his exploring in, in our uh, western rivers. And he was a big proponent of fire use. And he kind of got into a public argument with uh, Gifford Pinchot, who I recently mentioned. He's the first chief of the USDA Forest Service. And he was all about fire control. It's kind of unlike me to not side with the forester in a, in a discussion like this. But in this case, I think I got to go with uh, Powell. And at the time, there was an uh, article in a, a popular the Timberman um, Journal magazine. And that, that talked about this debate. And forgive me for this racial slur at the time that was used. They called this Paiute forestry, or the fallacy of light burning. And the assistant forester of the U.S. Forest Service penned this article in 1920, saying, among other things, the advocates of light burning, or Paiute forestry, as he called it, assert that fire should not be kept out of the pine forests, and that the advocates of this system propose to burn them regularly every few years. Well, I propose and suggest that if we had listened to Powell and not Pinchot back in those days, we wouldn't be in quite the predicament we are now with such a deficit of fire on our landscapes. And a few examples of where light burning works. The easiest example is a ponderosa pine forest. We have many of these around Utah and, uh, and in, uh, it creates this forest was underburned, I think mostly from wildfire in this particular case. 
and it makes it more resilient to disturbance. It's less inclined to, to have uh, insects and disease problems and less inclined to have uh, intense uh, forest replacing wildfires. Here's another example, and these examples can be found all over the western U.S. from New Mexico, underburn ponderosa pine uh, that I saw just uh, this fall, and it was this last summer I got to see these unburn, underburned ponderosa pine forests in Montana in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and it, uh, it's an effective way to manage this type of forest. No discussion of forest ecology and fire ecology and, and resilience would be uh, complete without at least a little mention of succession. Su succession is just the process uh, that uh, the land goes through, that plant communities go through over time. Uh, one tree might start to grow in the sunlight and create shade, and that makes it more favorable for shade, what we call shade tolerant trees, and it changes the uh, makeup of the forest over time. So the forest is always changing. I first learned this in about 1983 at Colorado State University when I was pursuing my forestry degree, and uh, my forestry ecology professor showed a photo similar to this one of sequoias, which I not terribly familiar with the sequoias. I've only visited them one or two, but one or two times. But uh, this photo or photo like this made a strong impression on me early in my forestry career. And um, and what we're looking at here are uh, pretty mature sequoias and underneath it are um, white fur growing up and other kinds of fur. And as I mentioned, this is part of succession over time, that shaded environment underneath the sequoias make it perfect for this white fur to grow up. They love it there. But the, and without fire, they will continue to grow like this. And now the situation we're, we're in is that if the, there is fire in the stand, it'll climb up these white fur and into the crowns of the sequoias. Sequoias have super thick bark. They can maintain fire or withstand fire if it's down on the ground. A surface fire but not up in the crowns that will kill the trees and we're losing lots of them to this now and this outraged me at the time and the way it was explained to me by my professor was that the concessionaires in the national park where the sequoias are uh, would not allow uh, prescribed fire because it put too much smoke in the air and so the simplified version of this in my mind was that uh, we were threatening the sequoias to sell more hot dogs and that just seemed outrageous and that's part of what drives my whole forestry career now for almost 40 years. I am a fellow of the Society of American Forests, Foresters, so I kind of take this pretty seriously. Um, and lots of examples of this around Utah. The simplest example, when we look out most of our windows, a lot of us can see juniper growing up in, in the grasslands. Um, and this is an example of succession over time, especially when we have a lot of grazing on these lands by livestock and by uh, wild ungulates. They prefer the grasses, they'll eat the grasses, and so that gives the wood a more, more of a chance to grow. So uh, our range has changed dramatically over the last uh, 150 years. Some say there's five to 10 times as much juniper as they, there used to be because of this process. And here's an example of succession in an aspen stand. This is up by Beaver Mountain just this last weekend. And um, we have a beautiful aspen stand and lots of uh, subalpine fir growing up in the shade underneath these uh, aspens. And over time, they'll grow up and overtake these aspens if left unchecked. Another example with fall color of fir uh, invading or coming into an aspen stand in Utah. And here's one final one from northern Utah. Of, uh, this is, uh, you can see in the center, there's aspen and lodgepole pine, which are both the pioneer species. They like it out in the open sunlight and they create that shade. And then underneath, we have all this fur coming in. Um, I, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, um, all these furs are coming in. And over time, they, they're taking over the stand and changing the makeup of it. Without fire or something to set it back, like insects or diseases, it will continue this way to, to change towards these sort of more shade loving species. Another example of the same thing going on under Doug fir in Utah, yielding to white fir growing up underneath it in the shade of the Doug fir. And up here in northern Utah, and I believe there in Richfield, there's a fair amount of uh, mahogany on south slopes. 
and they like it out in the open sunlight. I love these mahogany stands. This is one that happens to be up Logan Canyon. River Time is another example from top of Logan Canyon. This is a mahogany, these branches that you see underneath a, a Douglas fir tree that has taken over. And this Douglas fir forest has taken over this mahogany forest. And it's uh, a common example. I see this as I travel all over Utah. It's a pretty common successional example. I want to be clear that fire is not all roses. It can do some damage. This is uh, the Pack Creek uh, fire, uh, Pack Creek Moab uh, from a couple of years ago and uh, really messed up the stream pretty bad. So, uh, but the problem is we're going to have fire whether we like it or not. It can be in the form of prescribed fire. It can be moderated with prescribed fire and mechanical means. And I'm going to talk more about that. First, I want to talk a little bit more about my personal fire history as kind of a way of uh, further introduction. Um, I've been uh, in fighting fire since about 1983. Um, it was about that time I took my first wildfire class. Here's a photo of the front page, uh, Introduction to Wildland Fire by Stephen Pine. I'm going to kind of come back to this a couple of times through my uh, presentation. This is my fire textbook, and uh, eventually I got to meet Stephen Pine. Um, I started working on the fire line in 1983 in northern Montana um, on the Kootenai National Forest. So this is a, a fire line that we're digging here. Um, back in those days, forgive my old grainy photos, but some of these photos are from my entire 40 year career in forestry and wanted to share them with you, even though they're uh, not the most modern digital crispness that we're used to. So please forgive some of these older photos, such as this one. In 1987, I had the opportunity to go onto the Flathead Hotshot Fire Suppression Crew out of uh, near Glacier National Park in Northwest Montana. This is us digging line or cutting saw in line in uh, Western Oregon. And it was a, a great education being on the fire crew that way. I was able to go literally border to border and coast to coast across the country, fighting fire and learning how fire interacts with landscapes and uh, how landscapes uh, heal from fire over time. As part of that experience in 1988, I got to be, a, or had to be, I'm not sure how to put that, uh, a Yellowstone firefighter on that uh, hot, flathead hotshot crew. We spent several months in and around the Yellowstone ecosystem on several of the different fires there. This is a summer, a photo from the summer. I was in Yellowstone up on the Madison River. It can be seen in this picture. And from those 88 fires, it resulted in this lodgepole forest that has come back in. And the post-fire effects, um, um, slowly lodgepole likes to come into these. This one is in the Bob Marshall Wilderness area in Montana. You can see a little lodgepole coming into this uh, fairly old fire. It's uh, pretty slow to come back uh, at this particular one. And um, by way of more personal history, in the 1990s, I was a contract firefighter uh, out of uh, northern Idaho, a town called Sandpoint for a company called Inland Forest Management. And I ran lots of prescribed burns like this. I was an ignition boss and a prescribed fire specialist. And it really made an impression on me. And it became kind of one of my life's missions is to promote uh, more prescribed fire uh, in the forest. I just could see the importance of it everywhere that I worked in the forest. And along that lines, I uh, came here to Utah in 1999 to pursue my uh, graduate degree. And I produced uh, a video, this video called The Missing Fires for the for the National Park Service and got to go to every national park uh, with a fire program in the, in the country. And uh, as part of that, I got to go to, uh, remember Stephen Pine? This is a, uh, this is just a screen grab from uh, that Missing Fires video that I produced. And uh, Stephen Pine was, I'll remind you, the author of my original textbook in fire. So it was quite an author, uh, quite a, Quite an honor to go to his home. This is on his front porch where I interviewed him. And since he has written, he's uh, certainly the most prolific author about wildfire in, in the world. So it was quite an honor to go there. And I included much of his uh, interview in the in my Missing Fires video, which you can also see on our forestry.usu.edu website. 
And uh, one of the things that he said to me that day, I did not put it in our, my video, but it, it kind of stuck with me. He said, one of the problems is we have put the fire in the box, meaning that we used to, you know, in our society, we used to be more in tune with fire. And over the last 50 years, industrial revolution or 100 years, we've kind of put it inside our furnaces and inside of our stoves, and we don't have that interaction with it anymore. And, and that separation is kind of made, makes it hard for us to accept fire now. And I'm going to come back to this as sort of a, a ironic thing that he said to me, and I'll, I'll kind of finish up with that point. But now I want to talk a little bit more about building resilience in the forest, especially with fire. And first, I'd like to start with a, a definition from the Dictionary of Forestry. Resilience is the capacity of an ecosystem to maintain or regain normal function and development following a big disturbance. The disturbance we see here is uh, uh, bark beetles. This is spruce bark beetles here on the Wasatch Plateau perhaps uh, 10 years ago, and they were they had a significant impact on Utah. This is up on Wolf Creek Pass around 2002, close to when I started this position, and um, it's an Engelman spruce stand, a pure Engelman spruce stand. And the problem is it's all the same age, more or less, and it's all the same species. And that lack of diversity kind of creates a lack of resilience. And here's the same stand about 15 years later and uh, almost uh, pure mortality. There's a little bit of subalpine fir that's still surviving in the stand, but all the spruces succumbed to the spruce beetle over that time, demonstrating a lack of resilience. So my point tends to be, we like to say as uh, forest managers, if we kind of got into these stands and did a little bit of harvesting and uh, broke up the continuity of the stand over time, then we'd have young trees coming in where we had harvested. And then we'd have this all aged forest and not just a single aged forest. And that is much more resilient. because so if the spruce beetles come in, they like those big old trees. They tend not to kill the small trees. There were so many spruce beetles here uh, at this time that rule was broken and they did kill trees down to four inch diameter. But even then, if we had trees less than four inch diameter, they could be 20 years old. And so we'd be that far ahead of the game instead of losing everything at once like, like we have in some of our bark beetle attacks. And again, the single species dominance is uh, spread evenly across the terrain and is part of the problem. This lacks resilience. We have a lot of this up Logan Canyon, dug fir forest like this. The whole uh, south side of the road as you drive up Logan Canyon where I live is pure dug fir. And without any uh, discontent, discontinuity, <laughs> unless we break up that landscape a little bit, uh, we're going to have problems in the future. Uh, I worry about it. And I suggest uh, that active management is one way to increase diversity and then increase resilience. And there's lots of examples of this going on around Utah. Um, here's one uh, where we see a lot of juniper being cut by the Watershed Restoration Initiative, funded by that, and work done by the USDA Forest Service here next to Logan. And so it's not just a continuous stand of juniper here. We have, after these piles and these cut junipers will be were burned, and we have a little bit more grasslands mixed in with juniper stands, and that diversity increases resilience. And examples of this can be found all over Utah, here down next to Cedar City and Cedar Mountain. This Aspen stand for years, this family, the Lister family, kept their trailers in there when they went up to sheep during the summer, hot summertime and get out of the Cedar City heat. Uh, they would stay in this Aspen stand and it has completely fallen apart and doesn't, doesn't even exist anymore. And part of that is because of a lack of resilience and lack of disturbance on this, this site. I'd like to point to this example for uh, a good lack of disturbance. Uh, it's a site that most of us know in Utah. If you know, drive up and down I-15 like I do, uh, you see that big bee on the hillside uh, for, for beaver, Utah. And it's just grown in all around that bee. If you visit the um, historical society there in beaver, you can see photos of, of this bee when it was just open grown. And now it's all juniper and pinion and completely closed in and, and a real wildfire threat. 
that. So again, if we could open up this landscape and change it a little bit, cut one portion, leave one portion over time, that will make it more resilient. Excuse me. So treatments like this one, uh, this one's right along I-15 between Beaver and Cedar City. And it was done by the BLM about 10 or 15 years ago, closer to 10, I think. And uh, it opens up that juniper, kind of thins it out and increases the diversity on the landscape of, of different sizes and ages of trees. And that increases the resilience, makes it more able to withstand uh, insects and diseases and fires. And so I suggest that we can't just start with prescribed fire. We need a combination of mechanical treatments. We, it's, uh, treatments is sort of our term in our field for uh, harvesting or thinning, and uh, that has to be part of the solution. Essentially, we have pretty three very simple choices on how to manage our forest. We can just leave it alone, but it will manage itself in the form of big and hotter wildfires like we have every year. Um, we can put a little fire into it with a form of prescribed fire, or we can do mechanical things like harvesting and thinning. So our, our choices are somewhat limited. There's a lot of nuance within each of those, but uh, that, that, those are kind of the facts. Um, and we believe it's most effective to mix mechanical treatments with prescribed fire, like we see here, this BLM employee lighting uh, fire uh, south of Bear Lake a few years ago. And so with the lack of disturbance in Utah, I worry about the next um, big forest disturbance, such as the spruce bark beetle has been and, and the mountain pine beetle has been in the Uintas. Um, and this is an example of these white little woolly things are an example of this uh, invasive new insect in Utah. It's been known since about 2017. It's called balsam woolly adelgid. If you want more information on that, you can find that on our forestry.usu.edu website, but we're seeing this show up all over Utah. And in uh, on the Payette National Forest up around Boise, for example, about 70% of the spruce fir or of the subalpine fir has succumbed to this, this insect. So it could be a pretty big threat. One thing, another thing we're trying to do in Utah, or at least experimenting with, is this uh, method of uh, roller felling. There was actually an article in the Salt Lake Tribune about it on Sunday. And uh, this company called, uh, formerly known as 106 Reforestation, and now they call themselves the Atlantis Foundation, has developed a system where between two large bulldozers, they have uh, a cable to this, uh, a, a, a roller ball. Uh, and this was their original roller ball. They've uh, modified it since then, and there's several different iterations of it. But uh, it's something we're experimenting with here in Utah, and USU um, had the honor of doing a bunch of research associated with that that we're just uh, putting reports out for right now. And, and as part of that report, my colleague Larissa Yocum and colleague uh, Justin DeRose have found that um, aspen, we've always wondered if aspen can be a good fire break. And we've always been had that experience as firefighters that it does, but uh, the research coming out of this um, uh, kind of provides some nuance to, to that. It's not just a black and white thing. And the national forests are, are doing lots of uh, mechanical treatments and followed by prescribed fire. The Fish Lake National Forest is one of the leaders in this way, especially all the fire. The guys are getting on the ground down there. I think it's a great thing. But there are some modern challenges with this that we didn't have to used to deal with early in my firefighting career. Um, the amount of wildfire and the amount of homes in the wildland urban interface WUI, some call it WUI, that has dramatically increased in the last 40 years. And that makes it so much harder to manage wildfires anymore. Some of my colleagues complain that we don't manage the forest, but we manage fires to protect homes. And, and so we need to perhaps find a better way to build our homes and to defend our homes uh, against these fires. And here's an old example, but I'd like to point out 
that um, uh, this is a Los Alamos fire. And I, I put my, uh, my little text box in, box in the wrong spot I see now. But if you look behind it and around the text box, you can see that the needles are still on the ponderosa pines around these burned homes. Not so much so in the top of the photo across the street. But with all the, noto all the needles on the photos around that text box and behind it, um, what that tells us uh, as firefighters and um, inspectors that is that uh, wasn't the vegetation, wasn't the pine trees that carried the fire to these houses. It went house to house. And this sort of was a new thing in, uh, in the last 20 years. And now we're seeing it more and more. It was a big deal. And uh, the fires in Boulder last fall or two falls ago. This is a buddy of mine uh, sleeping on the rocks. I was kind of got a kick out of this photo back when I was a firefighter, and this is how it was. We would uh, we would get so tired we would sleep just about anywhere, and um, and firefighters are even more tired now. They get twice as much the uh, twice as many hours as we got back forty years ago. For us, uh, for a firefighter uh, in that sort of category, your measure of success of a season is how many hours of overtime you had over the course of that season. And we used to think it was a great season if we had 600 hours of overtime that would pay for us to pay off our student loans and take a little time off during the winter and, and travel a little bit and relax and get ready for another fire season. But now the firefighters, they're commonly getting twice as many hours of overtime, 1,200 more hours of overtime. So it's uh, they're getting more out and it's really kind of hard to, to find folks anymore to do this much work. And one of our personal uh, local uh, responses to this here at USU Forestry Extension is, um, it is a, try to find a way to reduce these hazardous fuels is what we call that extra wood in the woods uh, without uh, in a new way without just burning piles and prescribed fire and try to create this new tool that I call big box biochar kilns. I've had the good fortune of being able to develop this technology over the last five years with a series of grants from Utah State University. And uh, when I go back to that quote that I mentioned Stephen Pine said one of the problems is that we're putting fire in the box and it's in, the, in stoves and furnaces and not just uh, we don't handle it anymore. And I find it a little ironic that my career has led me to this end where I most of my work, a lot of my work now is all about putting fire in these boxes, these large metal boxes. We use a mini excavator or other excavator to load the wood. Um, and then I'll go through the process with you. And we have a workshop on this coming up on April 19th in Twila at the Twila landfill. And we'll have three different kinds of kilns like this making biochar. And this is biochar that you see in, in the front of the photo. This is essentially charcoal made as a soil amendment. There is no other way to teach people how to sequester carbon in a durable fashion. We put this material into our soil and has a thousand year half-life. And so um, the trees take the, they photosynthesize, they take carbon dioxide out of the air, turn that into carbon in the form of wood. And through this process of burning this way in these kilns, we preserve about a third to a half of that carbon. Like I say, we put it in the soil and it's got a thousand year half-life. So here's the process of doing that. Um, we load up one of our kilns. I, this is the more popular kiln. I've uh, built uh, half a dozen of these now around the country. Um, we call it the BB12, big box that's 12 foot long, six foot wide and four foot tall. It weighs about 2000 pounds. And I've scaled it down to this size so that uh, it can be handled with a mini excavator. It doesn't need a great big excavator or a special trailer or anything. This one's double wall construction. That, that helps protect the operators from the heat from the heat and improves the heat distribution. So we just load it up with uh, with uh, forest debris that has no other value and uh, it's in, in fact is a liability because of the fire hazard from it. And we top light it with a drip torch as shown here. And then over time, in the next few minutes, uh, this flame cap will form over the top of the kiln. We're looking right through the fire. There's almost no smoke coming out of it. And uh, consume that flame cap consumes all the combustibles as they rise up through that heat column. 
And in fact, that uh, workshop in Twilla that I mentioned, that's one of the points of it will be there burning all week. Um, and the fire lab from Missoula is coming down to do emissions testing on these kilns to hopefully show that they are not as uh, polluting as uh, just open, open pile burning. And perhaps we can get an exception for the air quality uh, work that we do around this. And so we keep uh, loading the kiln with fuel until it is full of coals like this. And we're looking for this moment when the uh, flames die down, like you ex we, most of us have experienced during a campfire late at night when the flames just kind of poof out and it just goes, turns to glowing coals or glowing combustion. And at the end of the shift or mid shift at lunchtime, we'll quench it. We'll uh, put the fire out by putting about 300 gallons of water on a kiln of that size. And that preserves all this carbon. This material here is about 85% pure carbon. Um, and then tip the kiln over um, and uh, keep quenching the biochar as we go. And one of the advantages of this approach, I've worked a lot with more high tech kilns that all, always require uh, chipping. And in a lot of cases, it was more expensive to chip the wood than it was to actually convert it into biochar, pyrolyze it, as we say. And so uh, it's part of the motivation for coming up with this uh, more simple, low tech approach. Um, yeah, and you'll see more of this, I imagine. And just want to remind everybody that we have a long history of charcoal production in Utah. These are these beehive shaped kilns. These happen to be just over the border in Wyoming, next to Evanston, Wyoming. It's a historical site and they've all been refurbished. But back then they were making charcoal for the uh, uh, iron smelting industry. And you can find these all over Utah, Nevada. And uh, so we have a long, history of charcoal productions. It's nothing new. And I got to give a presentation about these big box kilns at an International World Congress of Foresters in uh, Brazil. And I learned about these kilns, very similar to the last photos that I showed. Uh, these are these, they're not quite beehive shaped, uh, but uh, these small mud based kilns that they use in Arizona excuse me, in Brazil, and uh, did some calculations with my colleague there. Um, and we found out in all of Brazil, these little kilns are spread out all over the country there. And um, they are not making it for biochar. They're making charcoal for for the food that they like to cook. They, they like uh, charcoal meat as part of their culture. But even more importantly, um, most of this material is going to the iron and steel smelting industries. But uh, as an example, and as a way to get a handle on the scale, perhaps, we found out that in one year in all of Brazil, they feed kilns like this, and there's many, many of them around the state, around the country, um, as much wood in one year goes into these kilns as exists in all of Arizona and all of California right now as hazardous fuel. So that's uh, all material that can feed a wildfire. And so that just kind of puts it in perspective that this seems to be a big wicked problem or, or wildfire problems in the United States, but this is a perspective that indicates some hope and that maybe we can get a handle on it with these sorts of approaches. I have some fact sheets on this sort of thing uh, on that same website, forestry.usu.edu. I like that the uh, uh, Joint Fire Sciences Program, the national program, sort of a cooperative thing between the different agencies, like the Forest Service and the Park Service and the BLM, and they wrote up our biochar kiln approach as a success story a couple of years ago. And this is my contact information. I'd be happy to talk to any of you. Uh, send me an email and give me a phone call. And uh, I'd love to carry on this conversation if you're interested. Thank you for your attention.